Um, so thank you, and I'm inspired to be here. I've already been inspired just by the morning conversations that we've had. And brilliantly, Nina and Stephanie talking about what they talked about leads into a solution that we're working on with uh, my team. So we'll jump in. It starts with a flight that I was on to Washington, D.C. to speak at an ethics conference. And uh, I happily found myself seated next to a professor from Duke University. And I thought, hi. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, I have long harbored the dream of getting my child into Duke University or an elite university like this. And now I've got five hours to find out exactly how to do it. My son at the time was four years old. <laughs> So the professor took one look at me, and I could tell by the look on his face, I was not the first parent to have a conversation like this with him. So that was 18 years ago. I've got, as uh, the bio said, I've got an MBA. I worked in strategy, leadership development. I, I worked in M&A, technology. I was in cardiovascular uh, research, looking at, at developing new technologies. And I, I started to notice um, the, pro the professor, over this five hours, went on to tell me what he thought the secret to success was. He said, there, there are only 10% of the kids at Duke and at all of the selective universities around the country, only 10% of the kids are gonna be truly successful and happy there and in life. I know who they are and I know why and it's not what you think. And so he told me over the, that flight what they were and I started noticing that the things that he told me about what contributed to those successful kids, students, were the same kinds of things that I noticed were, were um, the attributes and the principles in effective businesses, effective teams, effective individuals. And like Nina was talking about, if we could embed some of that way of being in younger kids through education, through modeling in our families, if we knew what those were and we could model that in classrooms, families, organizations, we could start to shift the culture. What I was most concerned about were the things that Stephanie talked about, the high pressure, high stakes, the lack of failure. I'm doing a project with UCSF right now. The um, people that get residencies at UCSF are at the top of their class. They come in, they need to collaborate and work with their classmates to solve really challenging healthcare issues and they have absolutely no practice in how to collaborate. They've been elbowing everyone else out of the way to get to the front of the line, and their parents have been helping them. It's the culture that we're in, so let's go forward and say, we talk to parents, or I talk to parents around the country, uh, and this is not news. I'm gonna go quickly through how we got here because how we got here helps us figure out how to get out of here. So how we got here was this culture that we're all living in. When we ask parents what they all want for their kids, for those of you who have kids who know kids, who were a kid, you know, what is it? What do you want for your kids? I want my kids to be happy. So that's, and then right after they say happy, they say and healthy, because they don't want to jinx it, because <laughs> I don't want to jinx that. And then, kind of as a throwaway statement as they're walking away, they say, oh, and I want them to live up to their potential. So that is where the rub occurs, to live up to their potential, because that, in our minds, equals success. So we talk about, in our culture, we think success leads to happiness. Broad, broad assumption, culturally, everywhere we look, all of the messages that we get say success leads to happiness. It's why some of the majors now are tied to these six-figure incomes. So um, the question is, is that true? So we try to get at this when we work with groups of parents, and we ask them, what do you believe drives success? And uh, we, we talk in groups of 30, 100, 300 parents, and they talk in small groups. What do you believe drives success? We give them two choices. Good grades and a packed resume are the most important driver of my child's success or predictor of my child's success, or well-being, critical thinking, and resilience are the most important predictor of my children's success. So you can hear, for those of you that have kids that are growing up, that this absolutely is the crux of the matter. And you can hear the air sucked out of the room. Everyone wants to say that they believe B is the most important predictor of success. And after much discussion, they do all come to the conclusion 
Actually, what they want first is both. I want both. What they come to the conclusion finally through much facilitated conversation is that B can lead to A, but A, as Stephanie shared, does not lead to B. And happiness, by any definition, starts with, with B. So, well, I just talked to 50 sophomores, juniors, and seniors in high school, and they started the first thing they put under happiness when we were talking about defining happiness and success, which nobody takes time to do. We have these kind of preconceived ideas. They started with money. And then by the end, they asked me to cross it out, that they had moved in their thinking that money was not uh, going to be the most important predictor. OK, so here's what, here are the messages that we get from the culture everywhere. The media and the businesses that they represent have a stake in us believing that success is scarce that if success is scarce, they can sell us goods and services to help us prepare our kids, to help them move to the front of the line. So they'll be the ones chosen to these elite institutions that will guarantee their success, which will then lead to happiness. They pile on. They pile on from the goodness of their heart with the, with the intention to prepare their children to do well. They pile on. Uh, when I show this picture to kids, they laugh until they don't. They recognize themselves in this picture. And I don't know if you can see it, this little girl's got her backpack on, and she's got her burrow with everything else she's responsible for doing, starting at eight years old. So stress, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you guys, you all know this, stress, distress, and anxiety are up. The cortisol levels in kindergartners equal those of executives uh, in large corporations. So we have pushed the pressure and stress down to our kids at the youngest ages. With all that work, preparedness is down. We would think sacrificing a little bit of sleep, taking those AP classes, foregoing fun, foregoing a connection to nature, sitting down with my books and doing this, I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, do better in life. So the push to be all and do all has interfered with our kids' ability to be well and do well. We've, we've asked kids to follow, follow the instruction, and what we really need for the future now is to teach kids to lead. And we're talking now about how we can teach kids to lead well in their own lives, to know some of the things that you both talked about. Who am I? Who is my authentic self? And how can I go do work that matters to me and to the world? So the way we do that is to teach uh, the language and processes and experience of leadership from pre-K through professional. We teach it directly to parents. We teach it to parents in schools. We teach it to parents. Uh, High-performing schools in college prep communities bring us in to talk to their parents about how they can support their kids, not doing their homework, not writing their essays, not pressuring their kids, allowing their kids to connect. So we talk directly to parents, we talk to teachers, and we talk directly to kids. So we've expanded the definition of what leadership is to mean any time you make a decision that has a positive or productive outcome, you're, making a, you're taking a leadership action. It's inclusive. Every, every one of us can be a leader. Every child from the youngest age can see how they make a difference. And then we talk about big L leadership, which is maybe leading a project, you're the only one, or leading others. But Pursuing a worthwhile goal, motivating yourself or others to pursue a worthwhile goal. And then we've got innovation, being able to apply creative ideas that have value in the world. And when we do this, we can build kids who have responsible responsibility. They know what to do, and they step up to do it. They know why they're the ones to do it. And so they stay with it even when it's hard. It's the why connection that Stephanie was talking about. If I know why I'm working on math or why it's important to keep my room clean, I, I'll show up and do the work. I'll make these choices. And the last is in under innovation, resourcefulness. I know how to do it and how to work with others to do it. So when we set this up as a goal for parents, for teachers, that these are our goals, with the outcomes being that the kids can lead well, they can be well, and out of that flows doing well, we start to see a shift. We use a win map, and we use this with the parents. And for a lot of parents, they haven't had a chance to do this. And this is not uh, brand new. It's, it's a, a codified what we know works in other arenas. You've seen this model before. So Wired, what am I naturally good at? 
The interests are what do I like? What do I care about? What do I like to do? And then needs. What opportunities do I see in the world and how I can apply who I am with what I'm interested in to make a difference in the world? We use a, a leadership model that's universal. We've got executive teams at large uh, corporate organizations using these with their teams. And we've got kids using them in, the, in the 10 years old. All right, so I have to wrap up. We talk about the strategy, what tactics are you going to use to achieve it, assessment to get and stay on track, routines to transfer responsibility, and then train to um, develop any skills that you may still need. All right, the last thing I have is a story of kids that did this at age 10. They are connected to themselves. They're connected with their teammates in their classroom. And they move on to identify outside of their work projects, outside of their school projects, what needs are there in my community? We base them on social, emotional, and academic, so we're baking in compassion. And the kids go out. The faculty is, is trained to support the kids in taking the lead. So where a principal might have said before, oh, there's a duck that's laid eggs close to the walkway coming into school, we'll get maintenance, we'll take care of that. Now what the principal says is, what ideas do you have about how you might solve that? They start understanding how to do things. We'll just go two more pictures. These particular kids built a fence, put up a sign, and the ducks were born. Kids could watch. They stayed out of the way. And those kids said, this was not about the fame. This was not about glory for me. This was about the ducks. I made a difference in the life of the ducks. We've got a million stories of kids making these changes, of families changing. And I think that's it. We work together with schools, the community, and, and families. And we can embed exactly what Nina and Stephanie were talking about. We can embed in kids a sense of connection to who they are and how they can matter in the world. All right. Thanks.